Ting is an innovative multi-channel creative director with expertise in brand evolution and a proven track record of creating compelling editorial driven 360 brand experiences. Prior to joining Saks Off Fifth, Ting served as the creative director at Nine West Group. She has a wide variety of experience coming from MTV Networks, Allure Magazine, AR New York, Ann Taylor, and Wyden and Kennedy that have contributed to her fashion luxury branding experience. Expertise. Um, at Saks Off Fifth, Ting oversees all aspects of Saks Off Fifth creative to develop, plan, and deliver a strategic vision for the brand. Ting joined Saks Off Fifth in September 2020 and has led the organization's visual rebrand, including the introduction of the new tagline, Where Fashion Takes Off. Ting holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design and currently resides in New York. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so to, to start off, you studied at school, Rhode Island School of Design. Yes. Um, it was an amazing, amazing experience, a really um, foundational experience in my career. Um, I was served, oh, do I? If you want to take your mask off again. Oh, thanks. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you can you. okay thanks. <laughs> um, all right, so. So it, it exposed to me, exposed so many um, new experiences and opportunities there that I wouldn't have otherwise experienced um, in the world of art and design. People were really passionate about um, creative there, and um, I was at a university beforehand, and I think in a smaller environment in art school, people were really focused on, on their passion and obsession with uh, creativity. Um, they had an unparalleled dedication to the study of the arts um, that I couldn't have found at the university, so yes, yay to art school. <laughs> <laughs> what did you study at the university? Um, go to the next slide. This is me like like a million years ago, but this is, um, so there were three um, foundational classes that I took there. Um, one was graphic exploration, which is the study of the balance of black and white space and learning how to use negative space. Um, so when you look at logos, uh, you'll this is this this is what you're looking at is like the balance of black and white space. It's also when my um, when my art directors are doing emails, I'm always looking for that kind of balance of negative and, and positive space. I'll go to the next slide. Then there's also a class called Visual Systems, um, where essentially the, the teacher brought out like Skittles, and we were asked to um, develop a system that was predictable but not predictable. He was a jazz musician as well. And I think a lot of this has to do with how things are sequenced in terms of film, books, any kind of storytelling, there's a certain kind of pattern. Um, so this is actually examples of Jennifer Bartlett's paintings, but it gives you this idea of like systems. Um, next slide. The third class that was really important to me was a uh, visual language where uh, we learned about signs and signifiers um, to explain what they mean when put together. So an apple is not just an apple. An apple has like meaning behind it. There's a mental concept of the fruit and apple, the freshness, but there's also the characteristics, like a pipe isn't a pipe. Today, a teddy bear isn't a teddy bear. So <laughs> there's, there's lots of meaning, especially when you're in advertising. Um, it's really important about how you explain and express something, a clothing, people, expression, um, all of those, the way things are coming together through um, through sound, voice, visual, that all tells a story, right? And the kind of story you tell is from the signs and the signifiers and how they're put together. Um, the next slide. Yeah, are you, do, are you all familiar, obviously, with the story that she's referencing with the teddy bear this week with Balenciaga? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's crazy. It's the way you tell a story, right? So yeah. it's, it, it has great meaning and it has great consequences. It has great impact. So I think... This is like a foundational study of how things in, in images, ideas, words are conveyed and how they're perceived by your audience. Yeah. Um, growing up, I spent my time exploring the world of the arts. I was obsessed with 1970s and 1980s art movements, performance art, uh, Laurie Anderson, Karen Finley, Robert Wilson. Um, we go to the next slide. I was obsessed with magazines as well. Um, 
I had a theater teacher at Brown, because RISD and Brown had this relationship, who encouraged me to join the cabaret group, um, try new things, experiment with different art forms. And through this experience, I was ex able to explore the balance of masculine, feminine. Um, we had a fluxus cabaret performance where the fluxus 1960s movement was all about DIY, about um, making art out of like anything and also um, expressing it in a way where um, the process was more important than the end result. So celebrating that process. Um, my professor also drew up my personality, encouraged me to share my personal thoughts and opinions, um, which helped me become the person that I am. And, and I think a lot of this embracing this is, is the same idea of like, th that has gone on to my career in terms of um, embracing who I am and encouraging other people embracing who they are. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about my career path. So, um, so there are there are different there are different ways to become a creative director. Um, the way that I became a creative director was I first became, was a graphic designer at MTV Networks, where it's about balancing typography, graphics, um, and putting image and type together um, to make a story. Um, or to make a pamphlet, and in this case, it was like the VH1 Music Fashion Awards a long time ago. Okay. In the next slide, Fun. the associate art as associate art director. Um, then it, this was about learning how to do a photo shoot. So the editors at, at Allure Magazine would bring all this product to us to the creative team and said, "Okay, Polly Mellon would come in and say." We want to sell the silver jewelry. Tell us a story about silver jewelry. And I said, okay, what if we shot it against a red carpet? So this is about how to do photo shoots, how to work with a photographer, and the styles to tell a story. Um, and that was essentially magazine world. <laughs> so, and then... Um, I skipped a few slides, but I was uh, an art director at a fashion boutique agency, as well as an art director at a real ad agency like White and Kennedy. At the fashion boutique agency, it was, it was all about image making. So it was about assembling like the best team and the best swipe to tell your story. Um, so at AR, I was you know taught the power of how to create the best imagery. And as an art director at a place like Wine and Kennedy, I was working with a copywriter and it was more about storytelling. Um, so a combination of graphics, photo shoots, to trying to build the most amazing team to do really powerful image making with the storytelling. Then going to the next slide then. I was also like a digital art director at Ann Taylor. Um, and, um, and learning about um, how digital effects, in, digital effects your storytelling, and also um, you have to have this systematic approach in terms of the way you do creative now because you're looking at how your audience is traveling through your site, right? So there's that information that you have to take. Then you're trying to tell your brand's story, and then in that case, then you have to have a systematic approach to combining all of that. <laughs> so it's a little different than yeah. what we started out for at Rizzi. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a combination fast. of, it's changed really fast. My portfolio has changed like three or four or five times in my career. Where it's like, here is, here are four by five slides of my work. Yeah. Here is a book of my work. Here is the website. Yeah, here's the <laughs> yeah, here's, yeah. <laughs> Um, so now I'm at Saks Off Fifth where everything has come together. Um, I'm really, really happy at Saks Off Fifth because I think it's a place where I'm uh, merging my values, everything that I've learned in my career. I've put everything together here um, in building this brand. Um, so, so what does it mean to be a creative director at Saks Off Fifth? Yeah, what, what is... Base, most basic level, what is your uh, function? So our... Um, Pretend we know nothing. I'm really, okay, I'm really, I'm so proud of our, our creative team. We um, develop, plan, and execute a strategic vision for, for our brand. Most recently, uh, we led the visual rebrand and the launch of our new tagline, where fashion takes off. It's celebrating 
the word off because there's many ways to interpret off, right? There's the discount off, but there's also takes off in terms of like, you know, flight. Flight, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, also, I think celebrating our offness and our uniqueness. Um, we want to celebrate the individual. So through significant customer research, we saw an opportunity to evolve our visual identity and brand voice to speak directly to our target customer. Our customer loves to shop and use fashion as the ultimate form of self-expression. Go to the next slide. Yep. We wanted to make sure that our creative and marketing truly reflects who we are as a brand, constantly pushing boundaries to make sure the ideas of self-expression and representation are woven throughout. Um, you can go to the next slide. So with our new target customer in mind, we've developed and launched a rebrand consisting of fresh look and feel with updated logo and brand colors. And um, I think what you saw before, it was the spring campaign celebrating self-expression. It's boundless and encourages our customers to chart their own course, leveraging fashion and to craft their identity. Um, you go to the next slide. I'm super proud of our pride campaign. Uh, it reflects the belief that fashion is deeply personal and an important part of self-expression through the vibrancy of color, through fluidity of gender expression, and the confidence in owning who you are in both fashion and beauty. Is it yep. And, um, and is the, the concept of donating to uh, charity during Pride Month um, new as of this year or? No, no, it's for, for several years now. Okay. Yeah, for, I think this, this we had it for the first year, maybe last year, two years ago, yeah. That's great. Yeah, and I think I remember Molly, uh, um, it was incredible, I remember when Molly said, like, this isn't about selling the product, it's about our messaging thing. Yeah. So, yeah. which is a pretty bold statement for a retailer to say. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it was a very special moment for me at Saks Fifth because it was about, you know, me exploring gender identity through college, then embracing ideas of masculine and feminine, and then working with a company that really embraces this and embraces, embracing people's authenticity. So, um, yeah, I was very, really happy to work on this. And it also, I think when we started working on this, the whole, the entire team was really excited and passionate about it, so... Yeah. Um, I can talk about the um, this the uh, the process. Oh yeah. Just in terms of the process, it's um, so the merchants will will buy the product for that season and think about like what what they think is going to sell. The marketing team will strategize a marketing plan and create a roadmap in all channels. Uh, create a brief. The creative. The creative team looks at that brief and strategizes on the brief and develops a concept. Uh, and the marketing and creative team together, they approve the concept and the creative team will execute the photo shoot to, to assets. So there's an example of a, an, an advertise, digital advertisement. Um, so that is the typical season for a flow. Um, and as a leader, um, I think it's, it's really important for me to to groom the next tier of talent and make sure they have a foundational retail knowledge to teach them how to marry it with creativity. Um, and I view that our creative work is, is a way to encourage our customers and associates to use fashion as the ultimate form of self-expression. Um, do you have, I, and I think I, I, that's okay. where I ended that's the visuals. Right. Okay. I wanted to end the visuals and I can great. answer more questions. No, well, it's, so, it's really fun to have the, the imagery to back up your path and kind of to, to set the stage for, for everything for everything you've done but um uh i'm wondering so you talked a little bit about what the, the flow of <laughs> of a mm -hmm. season looks like for you on a typical week you know obviously this this being a little bit atypical you coming here on a monday but mm -hmm. what are you usually doing um you know from week to week you know how does your week kind of flow through as you're dealing with it's very structured with a lot of meetings. Yes. So uh, we have a full team meeting. Um, I have roughly around like around 40 people on the creative team. So we will discuss weekly what do we need to focus on, what are our priorities for that week, because there's a lot of projects. We're usually working on three seasons at once. Wow. So I think, at, I think the past month it was like finishing up fall, working in holiday, finishing up holiday, starting spring, 
we're going into production for spring, so it's we're we're usually working on all three at once. At one time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's, uh, so that's the full team, and we're going through emails and homepages um, uh, and other, other advertising assets. Um, it's a full hour of just, like, making sure that we're, you know, getting to all the checkpoints. We have these amazing project managers um, that are kind of like the, the whips of our team <laughs> um, to make sure that we're getting to all of our milestones so that we can get our deadline. Um, and then I have a director's meeting where it's my, my five top people from uh, the project managers, the copywriters, the um, design team, the photo team, the styling team. So all together, um, you know, that those are my directors and we discuss, you know, what are our challenges and what are the business updates. Um, there are creative brainstorm sessions that are happening that are scheduled by the project managers. Um, so in terms of from beginning to end, there's a really big project with, with like 10, 15 different assets. From the beginning, there's a concept. We're looking at the brief and studying, the, studying it to make sure that we're answering that brief. And then to the end of it, making a plan to make sure that we can meet every milestone. Like, did we get approval here? Have we selected the images? Do we have the right copy? What is the messaging? Um, so all of that happens in our brainstorm sessions. And then in terms of like, of a large team, um, I have individual touch points with individual members of my teams to make sure that their teams are doing well. That's great. We're like a little, little, <laughs> little org organism, you know. Pretty, <laughs> yeah. pretty How many people are on your total team? About 38, 38 to 40, wow. yeah. Yeah, it's a big size. So. Um, what does an entry level job look like on your team? So I think that, um, I think mostly it's, so the entry level job would mostly likely be graphic designers. Um, I think uh, they're balancing the tactical and foundational activities to prepare for the future roles of greater responsibility. I think the first thing that um, entry level people do are they need to learn the systems, people, and processes. Right. So systems like how is everyone, how is everyone working together? What applications are people using to communicate with each other? Yeah. What applications do I need to know to make the work happen. Um, the people, who is above me, who is below me, who is sideways, who, how does the team work? How is the team structured? Processes, like how does the work flow? So those three things are really important upon entry level. Yeah. Okay. Just learning that, really, Just and learning. being very um, uh, ambitious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, at the outset of the semester, we as a class came up with some three main capstone questions to ask all of our guests throughout okay. the semester. And okay. one of them was, in a field of people who all want to be unique in hiring, what really catches your eye to set someone apart? OK, so I think about this a lot because I've gone through a lot of career changes. So I think about, like, here are three things that I think are, are, are really important for a potential candidate, right? Um, first of all is your portfolio. So it's looking for a strong portfolio that aligns with the role that they're going for. Um, I'm looking for a typography, hierarchy of information, imagery. Um, and I usually like to look at their Instagram feed just to get an, an idea of who they are and what excites them and what are they really passionate about. Because in a lot of ways, to build a strong team, it's all about collaboration, right? Yeah. And then in that collaboration, you want to make sure everyone feels really motivated. Yeah. So, and that, you know, creativity, motivation, collaboration, all that will lead to really great work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so the first would be portfolio. Second would be um, personality. Collaboration is core to what we do. Uh, and so we want to understand as a, as a potential team member, um, what, are you, what are you valuing? How do you align with the company culture? Um, I would likely ask behavioral questions of situational events. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then the third thing would be knowledge of the brand. How well do you know us? I would be looking for an understanding of our brand and our audience. Has the candidate done their homework? Um, do they have thoughts on what we could do better and change, uh, expand on? Um, I'd want the candidate to feel really passionate about the work and feel motivated to bring uh, you know, a heavy contribution and impact. That's great. Cool. Um, so how, how long have you been at? Um, I think two, two and a half years. Two and a half years. So you yeah. started right before COVID, right? It was uh, right like now. during, like yeah, right, during. right, the March, it happened in March, like Ides of March, right? Yeah. That year. <laughs> yeah. And then um, that September. 
Oh, okay, okay, so in the middle of it. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's any major things that happened during COVID that kind of changed the structure of the way you work. Um, well, or? yeah, I mean, before I was, before I was at Saxa Fifth, I think um, the team was, the, they couldn't do photo shoots. People couldn't be together, so they had to just, I think it has to do with how agile you are with what's happening around you, and yeah. you need to be really agile with what the business is what the climate the is like, right? Changing yes. Up the entire retail scope. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think before I came, I think they were trying to make emails out of whatever images they had, and um, you know, fortunately, we were able to start shooting. Um, I think, I think, COVID has changed our ways of working because, uh, in a lot of ways, we're in a lot of Zoom calls. There's, uh, you know, there's a work-life balance thing, but it's also brought like this intimacy with, you know. You see someone's cat, you see someone's dog, you see babies, you see husbands, you see everything. And it's it's almost like this, like there's a little bit more of an intimacy uh -huh. with each other. Yeah. And kind of like a casualness as well, which yeah. is which is nice for the team, I think. Um, That's yeah. And I think um, we're also focused on uh, moments that matter when we come together because I think that sometimes there's a certain amount of collaboration that can happen over Zoom, but there's another kind of collaboration that can happen when you're in person together. Um, so... I think that's that's really important for us too. Yeah, absolutely. And so the hybrid model is probably forever, or um, for now. I don't know. I think like we have to react to the climate, right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. To, to to whatever the situation is. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so you you switched gears yourself from full price to off price. Obviously, I just gave kind of a high level mm -hmm. view of what off price means because I didn't want anyone to not understand what we meant by that. But what have been the big differences for you on, on switching? Um, so types? for full price, um, I was I was at Ann Taylor and we worked with Lisa Axelson, who was this amazing designer at the top, and so. Every season, she would give us her vision of what the collection was about. So she said, it was about nautical, it's about botanicals, it's about stripes. So we would be essentially given what the inspiration of the stories were. Um, in off price, there's no, there's not one designer, and also in our off price, it's probably closer to like a department store model um, where there are several brands, mm -hmm. um, and. So there's no, there's not a designer planning what the collection is. So inherently, we have to be more agile and opportunistic. Right. So, um, and I don't want to speak for the buyers, but there's different ways that the buyers collect things, you know, for, collect merchandise for us. Yeah. So it requires the creators to create their own vision based on the knowledge of the comp what the company buys are and also what the seasonal trends are. So we look, we try to start with the trends of what's happening for that season. Um, we look at what the merchants are buying. We try to adapt what the merchants are buying into those trends. Um, and then we're responsible for creating the content of the stories. I see. So kind of, we still have your chart up here of like your, of the, the timeline of how you go through a season, but talking about buyers right now are probably buying, starting to buy for what, summer at this point? I think it's, yeah. I th um, we're working on, sorry, many seasons. We're working <laughs> yeah. on spring. I think they're buying for fall now. They're, they're yeah. already starting to buy for fall. So yeah, I think so. they start to loop you in on what they bought? It'd be January, February, I think, is fall, actually. So maybe it's summer, it's summer. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, but you're still working on spring. So you're not, you're not quite to where the buyers are timeline-wise. No, 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 but there's a... they're finished, yeah. they can kind of hand to you, okay, this is the, the complete picture of what... Mm -hmm. store it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as I just noted to you all, even though they're an off-price retailer and they take advantage of opportunity buys that happen in season, a lot of their product they are buying up front so they can have this, you know, mm -hmm. vision. Idea Planned buys, yeah. The big trends are what the big... Yeah, what are. we're what we're banking on. And, and also I think our big, our, our big trends are essentially sometimes a little bit more evergreen because, you know, we the, 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 the bralette might not appeal to all of our customers, so we might go for bright colors for spring instead. Uh-huh. So, yeah. And do you, do you um, work at all with the Saks office, the Saks Fifth Avenue office? Um, or are we're, you... we're, good, we're good brother and sisters. We're good siblings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, are you ever, like, swapping ideas, sharing ideas with each other? I think it... sometimes. I mean, I think sometimes we're talking to each other. Yeah. Um, for the most part, we're, we're pretty separated in our process, uh -huh. um, but we're... We're good siblings, you know. And yeah. if I have a question about process, I might ask my, my friend, the who's the creative director there. So, yeah. Is you know. there a lot of customer overlap between the two? 
Um, I don't know if I can answer that question. I don't know if I'm like actually knowledgeable to answer that okay, question, yeah. but I think there there could be. Yeah. Yeah. I know that our, our customer has, has been trendier and trendier and trendier mm. as uh, in the past couple of years. Yeah. 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 That's great. Um, actually, I guess like if you th think about the customer for Saks Off Fifth and the customer for Saks Fifth Avenue, um, we had a thought about this because we, we believe that Saks Fifth Avenue customer is probably um, head to toe Chanel, right? And the Saks Off Fifth customer likes to mix it up, mix yeah. the high and the low. And I think that in turn is your self-expression, right? right? Mixing the high and right. low, the Mardwell, the, you know, the Madewell with the Marnie, yeah. um, the styled you know, cold guy, mixing it all up yeah. and, and making it your own. That's so great. combining like street culture with you know, luxury. Yeah. And what I have to imagine that your markets aren't, don't overlap quite a ton. I mean, I think that Saks Off Fifth is in more locations than Saks Fifth Avenue, which is Yeah. And I think, locations. I think it's about access to, to, to your point. I yeah. think we want to, as we we're redefining the idea of modern luxury uh -huh. and making it accessible for more people. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, you have a team of 38 people. So I'm wondering if you have any successful training tools that you've developed over the years that have made it easier to manage such a large um, number of people and, and get people onboarded. Yeah, I'll say it's like collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Because, I, and I think we're we're constantly always looking for for more tools. I think it's you know right now it's uh, it would be like Slack, Rike, um, at another place I've worked in with Airtable. Um, but uh, I th and I think the most powerful tool for us is Google Slides because this is where everyone can contribute. From producers to writers to designers to photo people, we can all contribute to the deck in terms of planning a photo shoot, planning a campaign together. Yeah. It's like a hundred page deck of everyone contributing. Oh and it's a it's a live document that keeps moving. Oh. So cool. yeah, it's exciting. I think the it's it's the age of collaboration. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a great word. Um, but I, on the other side of that, is there anyone that you've ever worked for that was just such an amazing manager that you, you've kind of always emulated to be that boss? I've been really, I've been so lucky to have some really great bosses and, and mentors. Um, um, I think one of, them, one of them is in this room right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, the best, I, I would say like the best managers lead with empathy uh -huh. um, and are very people focused. And um, I think when you're people focused, you want to understand what, how people are motivated and understand um, what their strengths are and, and what their opportunities are and how to cultivate those opportunities. Yeah, that's great. That's a good way to summarize it. <laughs> uh, what's, your, what's one of your greatest successes thus far in your career? Um, I would say... Um, I think um, being a mother, that's yeah. actually the, the first thing I would think of as being a mother. That's, 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 and then... Of all the mothers I've had in here, I don't think anyone's ever said that, so I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it teaches you empathy at a very immediate level, yeah, right. and it teaches you to care about other people and care. And I think during my you know, trajectory, it was all, I think it was, I was more focused on myself and about like my identity, and, um, and then I think once you reach motherhood, it's, it's suddenly you have to consider somebody else and, and everything that affects that person. Um, and at a larger level, as a manager, you're thinking about your team and how to groom them and grow, grow them, right? Yeah. So, as a teacher as well, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. That's, that's the goal. Um, a, a second capstone question from the class was, what did your biggest failure teach you? I had a few. <laughs> I, think, you um, I think I think it's I think it's really important to know how to pick up uh -huh. after and, and realize that you know there's these terms like fail forward, fail fast because and it's about the process, right? I think something that the Fluxus movement taught me <laughs> the artists and designers about it's about the process and not the end product. So and expect to fail. You're not, it's not going to be perfect every single time. I actually, when I was going through my portfolio yesterday, I was trying to pull slides, I'm like, oh, that wasn't a good one. That, that, was, that, that, that was a learning experience. That was a learning experience too. And then I've had some really shiny moments. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's about like taking in the feedback uh -huh.
being open to feedback and yeah. then knowing that um, that things will fail um, and that know how to, it's a, like a test and learn kind of atmosphere, right? Yeah. You need to, you need to know how to like accept that and then pick up and move on from it and push forward. Right. And I think resilience is super, super important. Yeah. Yeah. I had a manager who always used the word nimble and I feel like that kind of yeah. picks up on what you're yeah. saying. It's like, you know, know when you've made the wrong path and quickly move on from that and not dwell in it. In it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and the final question for the, the class on uh, capstone question was, if you had a chance to talk to yourself as a young graduate, what advice would you give yourself? Um, I think, um, yeah, I think it's 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 the same thing. But the biggest failure and the the um, being open to feedback failure is inevitable. Um, everyone experiences challenges throughout their career. Um, it's how you react to it. Yeah. Um, I do Soul Cycle like every week, so it's like it's constant <laughs> person <laughs> charging me up every day. So. <laughs> That's great. Uh, do you when you start off your process and you feel like you kind of you take over here in the creative. Step. Is there a place that you go to get inspired to to drive things forward? Oh, I think inspiration everywhere, everywhere. Like travel. Um, I'm on Instagram a lot. Though. Yeah. It, um, but it's also, I think, I think experiences you know, IRL experiences. Like I went to the William Klein show at ICP recently, really loved that. Yeah. Um, I want to see the Wolfgang Tillman show at MoMA. Um, I think, um, uh, I look at, uh, I look at magazines still. Um, I look at T Magazine, okay. The Cut, uh, ID Magazine. I love what Mac Pat McGrath does. I think Pat McGrath is super experimental and really pushes creativity. Um, I think I've, I've always had design heroes and fashion heroes um, that I followed religiously ever since high school. Yeah, um, if you don't mind. Oh, so many. Um, uh, there is, uh, even in high school, I was like, obsessed with Paper Magazine, mm. so I eventually worked there as an intern. Oh wow! Yeah, I carried I carried a Xerox machine up and up and down some flights, wow. but um, yeah, magazines, Paper Magazine. Uh, there's uh, different agencies. M M Paris is an agency in pa uh, Paris that I think does really incredible work. Um, there's an Instagram handle called Differ TV that has a lot of like film references. Um, I think especially when you're working on commercials and videos, uh, you're always looking at, you know, video references for how to tell your story. Wow. Um, so instead of like image swipe, you're looking at video swipe um, for how you might tell the story. Yeah, so. yeah that's great. Um, coming back to your redesign, this big redesign, how long was this process to get off the ground? I think it was several months. Maybe it was like, yeah four or five months wow. and then I don't know it, it was the 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 logo the color there's the it starts with the graphics right so it's a typography color palette the logo the balance of black and white with that logo mm -hmm. um, the pattern that you can create with that logo um, so there's that visual graphic language that needs to be established then there's the storytelling, right? So there's this branding and storytelling of like, what are we, what are we embracing here? It's the word off, right? It's your unique, authentic self. Um, we're, this is this is a word that we like to own, right? In terms of like discounted value, but also celebrating the individual. Yeah, that's great. Cool. And then um, the visual that is so amazing. Where's that shot? Um, so. The, the idea, we actually wanted to um, shoot at the beach um, near a, a monster park. Um, we couldn't do that, so we found um, a mound of uh, a mound of sand. It was a construction site. Oh my gosh! <laughs> to look like um, uh, the beach desert. Kind of looks like yeah. a desert, yeah. Yeah, but I think the idea where fashion takes off is about like lift off about launching, mm -hmm. right? About, um, about this freedom of space in the expression of who you are through, through clothing. Yeah. So. That's great. How do you, 
as a marketer, how do you get feedback on what, you know, on the results of this? Or uh, I, ask, I ask our marketing partners, I ask our analytics partners. To, to find out like how how traffic is doing how you know what are they what are people reacting to we're always listening to what that feedback is in terms of how to kind of pivot our creative too yeah oh, that's great yeah well great I think that that kind of takes off my questions although maybe more will come to me um, does anyone in the audience want to chime in with some yeah um, Um, are you talking about, uh, okay, there's different types of portfolios. There's portfolios for design of clothing, <coughs> then there's portfolios for um, design of advertisements. Um, what, are you, what are you talking like, about? Um, like fashion design, I guess. Like, if you're like, applying to be like, a specific brand, like, you want to be like, an associate designer or design like, assistant for like, women's wear or something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not able to answer that question because I wasn't a fashion design major. I was a graphic design major. Um, that I want to answer that question. <laughs> um, so you're asking if, if the figures are more important than showing finished sketches of your designs is more important than the process. Um, I think in terms of any portfolio, I think it would you edit your portfolio so that it is the work that you want to do and you feel really passionate about. Sometimes when you're showing your work, you're only showing the work that you've, the professional work that you've done, but I think it's really important to show the work that you want to do and edit it to the work that you want to do. Um, I would probably say that um, likely as an advisor, I would say, I would show the finished sketches of what your vision is, um, but also show, you know, have an area where you can show process as well, kind of back pocket. Yeah. Do you think it's important to be consistent? So I if think you choose to do move words to you know, to concepts to finish that, I think so. do that for each. Mm -hmm. I think show. I think the very beginning it's kind of hard to have a consistency of what your brand is, but I mean I think personal everyone's a content creator now, so personal branding is kind of important, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think I know that in my past like showing my work and it was a whole variety of work and eventually five or six years in I was able to edit to the kind of work that I wanted to do right. instead of just this is what I can make make your portfolio the kind of work that you want to do yes I yes like yeah um, but I guess my question was more on format do you think like if if she ch if she chooses that she's going to do the mood board to concept to um, sketches and I know this is maybe a different area than you're used to, but when you look at someone's portfolio, do you like to see that kind of consistency with what's being shown as far as like the formatting? I think um, in consist consistency in formatting, yes, but if you're going to show process, it's more, most likely like a storyboard, right? It's because you're going from beginning to end, right? Yeah. Or a one pager of like the beginning to end of process. Got it. Um, or it's another, it's like an addendum that you would, you would make, right? So. Um, so yes, uh, it was a BFA in graphic design. Um, I, in some ways, I say like graphic design is more like commercial design, but I was heavily influenced, especially at RISD, by the fine arts, um, especially with theater, um, because I think in a lot of ways in theater you're digging into your soul of who you are. Um, um, that's why I think the Pride campaign really resonates with me because it's like this balance of masculine and feminine in my mind, um, and also. Um, uh, just like uh, the exploration of gender and um, yeah I think that uh, I, in so many ways fine arts affects because in the arts right you're always asked it's the, the art world asks the question it's forming the culture so in the commercial design world you're always affected by 
what are, what's happening culturally speaking in the arts world. They kind of go hand in hand. But in the commercial world, um, you're selling garments, you're selling merchandise, and you have to be really respectful of, of that story, right? You're not creating art. <laughs> you're selling goods. Yeah. But you're selling goods, and you're trying to sell, sell goods in a very innov innovative way um, that is inspiring and motivating others. Yes? I was going to ask, um, how have your duties changed as an art director over the years? Like from the beginning of your career as an art director to now, like how have like the different tasks changed? Like have they changed? Have the tasks changed? Yeah. And yes. So like what changed? Greatly, yeah. Um, so I'll I'll explain it again because I think it's sometimes a little bit confusing. But um, so when I was at MTV, it was about graphics, about t how does type work with image, layout, how to put everything together. That was the graphics, right? And then when I became associate art director to an art director, you're basically forming a team to you know, develop the photo shoots, putting a stylist with a photographer, um, looking at the merchandise, um, figuring out a story of how are you going to shoot it. Um, so that was more or less art direction. And then, then becoming an art director in a more traditional ad agency like White & Kennedy working with a copywriter, trying to tell a story. Um, so the project that I worked on at Wyden Kennedy was Cole Hahn and was reimagining the idea of the penny loafer. So the, pro the process was essentially like, okay, what are the attributes of the penny? It's, you know, it's copper, there's an idea of wishing, there's, um, you know, so it's trying to tell the story of the penny loafer and how, how do you tell that story in all the different platforms in a 360 campaign? So thinking about all the attributes of the penny loafer, um, the structure of it, how is it best shot? It's best shot from above because you can see the penny loafer. Um, that's the essence of the penny loafer, right? Um, and that will reflect back to signs and signifiers, right? Um, so in that way, it was more about storytelling um, at, the, at the ad agency. And as a creative director, um, you're essentially building teams to do project management, copy, um, what's the story, um, image makers, the photo team, um, and um, yeah, and styling. How, do, how are the clothes put together? I imagine the media has changed a little bit too, uh, like the medium. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which yes. From. yes. I think if you just pick up Instagram, like you're doing it all, yeah. <laughs> right? Aren't yeah, you? Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, having to think about what it's going to look like on a social campaign mm -hmm. is, you know. Very different from the way you would present it. in a branding campaign, because yeah. a, a social campaign, you want to, um, you want to be more like personal, a little bit more casual, more, a little bit more off the cuff, yeah. right? Um, I think branding is like more about this like bigger idea storytelling. Yeah. Um, but social, I think, is more like a, there's like a human aspect to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when you were first like starting a career, when did you realize it was time to move like to a different company or a different role? I think it's in terms of like how you're growing. Like mm -hmm. part of it is like, part of it is your, yourself is like, I, I'm not growing as much as I can here. I've been here for several years. Um, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I think I need to try something new. Um, when I was at MTV, it was, I was making a lot of, uh, uh, you know, offline marketing materials over and over again. Um, and I was really curious about fashion. So I think in a lot of ways I was following my curiosity, following my passion, and then my passion has kind of changed every couple of years. And also the landscape changed. And some things are not even up to you. Some, some things are just, you know, management changes, the team changes. Uh, you know, so some of it's not even up to you. Sometimes you, you know, you need to just pick up and move and then, and you need to figure out what's next. adapt yourself to the brand you're representing. 
in order to then tell their story best, even if you can remember something very different in your previous role. Yes, yes. I think that's I think that's has to do with like um right, like user and audience first, right? Who is the client? Who are you speaking to? Um so depending on where you're working, right, it's a it's a completely different audience. Um I'm trying to think about um when I was at the agency, the the fashion boutique agency, we would have like a brand called like Cesare Pacciotti is a very like sexy Italian brand or like Dolce Gabbana, very sexy Italian brand. And then we also had Jones in New York and the Jones in New York client was basically paying all of our salaries. So <laughs> we had to kind of switch, switch our mentality to, you know, what, what is, who is the Jones New York woman? Um, and then we also, and I think we also won like Banana Republic. So it was like, okay, what is the story about Banana Republic? It's Banana Republic is about like modern souls. They're connected to culture. They're connected to each other. Um, so developing a story that was specific to Banana Republic. Um, thinking, yeah, thinking about the audience, thinking about your client. Um, you do have to adapt to, it's, it isn't about like your vision. It's about the, the business's vision or what that story is not according to, you know, who, who is the audience, who's shopping there, who is attracted to that brand. That's a good question. I'm so sorry, I didn't hear What, what, can you repeat it a little louder? Sorry. What skill do you think was the most helpful to work your way up to where you're right now as a creative director? What skill do you think was most helpful to work your way up to being a creative director? I think it's that agility and nimbleness to adapt to what's happening around you. You have to really listen, listen to, listen to what's happening around you. Listen to the atmosphere, listen to what's happening in the zeitgeist, and and know what's happening culturally, and know how you can affect that, and how you speak that language in the zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, and then be really important. You know, be very uh, true to your brand, uh -huh. because so it's essentially like your it's your identity. <laughs> I think my team is going to laugh at me. <laughs> um, making a decision. <laughs> That's because, because the story could unfold in so many different ways. It could be, you know, and then, you know, I think as a creative, I think it's natural to like ponder and deliberate for a really long time of what the right decision is. Yeah. So that would be probably the hardest part. Making a quick decision. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Barney's? Yeah. Okay, sorry, repeat the he's, question. Uh, he's wondering about Barney's. And I loved Barney's. Yeah. Barney's is, is part, of, part of the reason why I went into this business oh, was looking well, at their ads. So maybe you did ask the right question for this person. But, <laughs> yeah, no, he was wondering if there's a certain misstep that you think they took maybe that didn't propel them forward. I think it's really, I think the retail business is, is really, really tough. And you have to be, you know, you have to be, I think there's your own vision, right, of what your brand is. But there's also, I think you have to be really smart about what's happening around you. Um, listen, listening to your customers of what they're responding to and not just dictating it. Yeah. I think there's like kind of an old way of advertising where you're just dictating the, the story, uh -huh. um, but you really have to listen to your customers and what they're responding to. Um, I think that's, and, and that's, and, I mean, that's like essentially digital, right? Like you have to embrace what the information is telling you. Right, right. And they expanded very fast from someone who was not, you know, was only one store for a very long time. They tried to expand mm -hmm. very quickly 
and maybe not listening to that customer as closely as they could have as they continue. Yeah, and I also think that in terms of your growth, you know, how how far reach are you going to have if you're speaking to a very specific audience? Right. That makes it depends, sense. right? How how you're going to grow that business. So. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I love Barney's. Barney's was like brilliance, a moment of brilliance. Yeah. That was a sign. 2020 was headed for disaster. I'm gonna <laughs> shut down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it that they found most valuable about you that made them choose to hire you? Um, I don't know. I'd have to ask them. <laughs> I'd have to ask them. But I am. I think going into an interview, I think it's those those three things, right? This your 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 portfolio is the the, the work that you're presenting, right? Uh, your personality. Um, I would think about uh, situations where you've overcome a challenge. Um, and to show, you know, what a great team player you are, how great it is, you know, you can collaborate with other people, um, a certain obstacle that you faced in a creative challenge, how you've overcome that. Um, the third thing would be how, how well do you know that company? Have you read all their articles about it? Have you studied the, their website, their, you know, social media? Have you studied everything about them? Do you know where they are in their business? Do you know some opportunities they have to expand? Um, what could they do better? And maybe not... I wouldn't gloat on that and how they could do better because I've also had a very horrible interview with Vogue where I said how much I could make them look better. <laughs> so, like I think it was like 20 years ago, but it was it was, it was sad. <laughs> I think in in a, in a nice way, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I actually in one of my other classes was uh, helping with resumes today and, and earlier this morning and. One of the main points I was saying to the students is that on your resume, you should be completely, you know, as braggy as you feel like you could possibly be. That is not a place to be modest at all. However, when you get in person, you want to make sure that you come across as modest and likable and someone that's collaborative and easy to work with. So, you know, get your foot in the door with the, with the interview and, you know, come across as really strong on your resume, mm -hmm. but make sure that you, are, you know, are a little bit more humble when you're face-to-face. Mm -hmm. -face. I don't know if you agree Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, family. My name is Irving. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, how long did it took you to like have more gained experience after being in school and with internships? How long did it took you to become an expert in what you do for work? Um, sorry, can I? Just because I'm such a visual person, can we switch over to where Saturday fashion <laughs> takes off? Sorry, that's it's yeah. like my proud moment here. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. What was the question again? Oh yeah. yeah. After school and getting uh, some experience I, by having some internships, how long did it took you to become an expert and what do you do for, for I think it, I, it's how, how long does it take? It, um, I answer. mean, I, I know um, when I graduated and was labeled as a graphic designer, and then you would go to up to senior graphic designer, then you go up to art director, um, some students coming out of school call themselves art directors. Um, I think it depends where you work. The, the label is kind of different. If you go to a traditional ad agency like Wyden Kennedy, you start out as an art director with a copywriter. Um, if you work for a design firm, um, I worked for like two design firms because those are my heroes. But um, when you work for a design firm, you start as, uh, out as a graphic designer. Um, I don't know. I think, it, I, I think it's, like the, it's about the process and the journey, right? Um, I don't want to put like a number to it. And I think there's, there's times like in different decades, it's like, I'm an expert. And then five, two years later, like, I, that, I, I, I am no ex I am not an expert at this at all. I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. And then three years go by, like, I'm an expert at this. And then I know nothing. So it's, it's cyclical. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And especially with everything days. changing, right? So yeah. you have to like, you know, I think... Five six years ago, I was like nudging my, my partner, like, "What is what is Google Sites?" What I <laughs> learned that. I need to learn that. No. <laughs> um, what do you believe are some of your of uh, your core values that you need to have in your current role? Wow. Okay. Um, I, I can speak for Saxaw Fifth Core Values. We have five eyes, and I, I'm going to botch this up, I think, because I didn't have it in my slideshow. But the, um, I think uh, innovation, inclusivity, inspiration, um, 
Oh my God, there's two more. <laughs> um, well, I think I think you know what I was saying before about empathy. I think that's. I think we put people first, and I think that's like that's really really important to me, um, in terms of motivating a team, in terms of motivating people to do their best work. Um, innovation. I think you 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 start you start every day like day one, as if it's you know it's a startup. Even if you've been with a company that's like thirty years old, you you, you start off with like you know. Every day is day one. Um, there's also an idea of like the rookie mentality. Like if you kind of approach something in a new way, you can innovate more too. So. Any other questions out there? Yeah, Matthew. Hi, how are you? Uh, I have a question. Uh, what advice can you give to a fashion designer student, almost graduated, who is trying to build uh, her own brand, fashion brand? And want to build like the storytelling of uh, their his brand. Like, how do I, um, uh, how do I um, create, uh, like, I don't know, this what you did in fashion? <laughs> <laughs> For someone who's launching yeah. their own brand. I think I think the first thing with, with first thing that you would think about is um, who are you speaking to? Who do you want to speak to? Who is your audience? And then start from there. Then you know how to create that world for that audience. And what are the stories you want to tell for that audience? Um, and don't forget who that person is the whole way through <laughs> when you get yeah. to the product, too. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. okay. And the story, the story um, how do you know if it's Always, always, yeah. I think we're constantly doing like a, uh, we we do some like smaller focus groups on our like our best customers, the best our, our customers that that speak a lot to us that actually like fill out the survey or you know and and also um, the people that spend the most with us or our, our stickiest customers. We're always listening to them. Um, I think that you know. We're, we're always trying to cater our creative to um, to what the data is telling us. What are the, the what are all the ways that you collect data on your customers? So you you obviously have focus groups, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. You have transactions. Mm -hmm. That that data. that is that I think yeah the customer votes right the customers yeah. voting on on what they um, what they react to. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, though, with branding, sometimes you want to show like the best, most inspiring product, and then what they walk away with is the black cashmere sweater. Yeah. But they're inspired so much by the creatives to to come into your store, right? Yeah. So, um, and a lot of ways, like it's not like you want to show the black cashmere sweater in your campaign, um, but that's usually what they're buying too. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Is there, do you actually? For instance, when you started this rebrand, did you actually go out and you know, elicit, like, invoke your own market research, or did you strictly go off of, you know, focus groups and and transactions to make your decisions? Your informed decisions. I think I think it's kind of going back to like what your your what your true identity is, and that's something that you know we're looking at our our stickiest customer. And our stickiest customer loves to shop, is really vibrant in their dress, yeah. likes to mix it up, um, really, you know, loves self-expression. Um, so there's a lot of significant customer research first yes. that was happening. At the same time, our, our Pride campaign was happening too, so we're already thinking about well, how does our brand is? How is our brand different from Saks Fifth Avenue? How, you know, what is really special about our brand? That it's there's access, right? There's there's access to this amazing value and access to all these incredible brands from contemporary to designer, right? Yeah. With that access, with that cl open closet, right? Uh -huh. You can choose how you express yourself. Yeah, that's great. So, I guess what I'm wondering yeah. though mm -hmm. is, uh, to how did you get the research on your customer? 
Is that, did I answer it completely with the focus groups and your transactions, or was there more to this? I wouldn't say uh, not just transactions. I think there are strategic partners that we enlisted as well. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So. Um, I heard an interesting, I, I lectured on an interesting fact this morning on big data, but that, um, you know, the new iPhones that just came out, they are a, um, the, the amount of information they hold in them is, you know, it's a $1,600 phone, it's more than ever before, it's a huge amount of memory in the new iPhones. And um, what Walmart collects in one hour of data from transactions in phones in their store and things like that is worth 2,500 iPhones per hour that they collect in big data. And the big data means nothing unless you analyze it and obviously mm -hmm. it's called down and, and you can, you know, formulate it to make, to make it make sense tell the story mm -hmm. that you need it to tell or to you mm -hmm. know, tell you who your customer mm -hmm. is and what she wants or he wants. Um, but I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> That's yeah. how much big data is, is out there and floating around with, with a lot of these big companies. Mm -hmm. I think we're still perfecting it. We're still trying to perfect it. Like how can we, you know, use data to, to you know, enhance our strategy. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Any other questions out there? Yeah, Irving. I have another question and this is like kind of funny but when you go out and you socialize, like how do you deal with people when they are like so <laughs> thirsty? Like, <laughs> what? what do you do? Like how do you deal with that in a very polite way? How do you deal with people that are thirsty? You mean like they're eager? When thirsty. Um, you go out and or someone introduces themselves and they're like, oh, so then what do you do for work? And then they kind of want to oh, work, but in like a very aggressive, direct, <laughs> so, Has that ever happened to you that you've gone out and someone's really super interested in the fact that you work at Saks Fifth and they want to? I think I just send your resume in. There's always people to review a resume. There's always, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I think I am that person. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm actually the worst person. I am that, that, I am that person. <laughs> Oh, um, the one that uh, referenced uh, fashion videos or just uh, movies, films. Mm -hmm. um, okay, differ differ .tv. Um, yeah, There's another one that's that's interesting. Diet products, always no, always talking diet about products. what's happening in advertising. Yeah. Um, yeah, Pat McGrath is very inspiring. Um, and M M Paris. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Being here. Thank you so much. I really loved it. Thank you.